This Week in Careers, you've got the power at work and more than you ever wanted to know about belly button gunk. Welcome to This Week in Careers, where we're trying to save America one job at a time. I'm your host, Lisa Johnson Mandel, author of Career Comeback, Repackage Yourself to Get the Job You Want, and still news editor at AOL Jobs. Although that promised CeeLo Green moment, it's coming. I can feel it. It's coming any day now. Okay, today we have a fabulous expert with us today who's going to tell us all about power, how to get it, how to keep it, how to swing it. And first, though, we're going to get to what I consider to be one of the grossest weak career moves of the week. Yes, there's a group of researchers in North Carolina who are not only getting paid to st study belly button bacteria, but they're also getting paid to post pictures of their own belly button gunk on the web. Okay, yeah, it's, it's kind of gross. That, that picture's not so bad, but we have bacteria pictures that just kind of make my skin crawl. Um, they say, they're trying to be cute about it. There they are. Isn't that nice? Wouldn't you like that print, uh, your uh, belly button gunk pic printed up there? They're trying to be cute about it. They see, the reason they're doing this study is because we want to know what lives on us. Very little is known about the life that breathes all over us. Each person's microbial jungle is so rich, colorful, and dynamic that in all likelihood, your body hosts species that no scientist has ever studied. And they say they're using belly button bacteria because when they ask for armpit samples, nobody wants to give them. Nice. They also go on to say that your navel may be, well be one of the last biological frontiers. It is time then to explore. Our belly buttons are relatively isolated, a place where microbes are safe. Because everybody has one, it's what once connected us to our past. Okay, I'm not buying it. I'm thinking that these brilliant scientists and researchers could be spending their time, resources, and brains on something a little more important. Um, I don't know how this study is going to look on their resumes, but I can just guess what it's doing for their love lives. <laughs> Put that picture up on your Facebook page. That's going to be beautiful. All right. Getting on to the tip of the week. Okay. This, the tip of the week is if you're a high stress person, if you're high strung, get out of the media. It's not the perfect job for you. Okay. Four of the top 10 most stressful professions are media related. They are public relations executive, that's number two, photojournalist, number four, newscaster, number five, and advertising account executive, number six. Okay, to come up with the most stressful jobs, researchers measured work environment, job competitiveness, and risk. And that's what they came up with. I bet you're wondering what number one is, aren't you? It's commercial airline pilot. And I'm thinking that air traffic controller has probably worked its way up into the top 10 since they can't sleep on the job any longer and everybody's watching them. But uh, anyway, completing the top 10 list in addition to those four media jobs that I told you about. Uh, number three is senior corporate executive. Number seven, architect. Eight, stockbroker. Nine, emergency medical technician. And 10, real estate agent. So there you have it, the most stressful jobs. Uh, according to a career cast study that they did. So I'm thinking that uh, host of This Week in Careers, I wonder where that measures up there. It is a media job, but it's not super high risk, I have to say. And if it were, I might want to apply for the job of the week because this week's job of the week, it's going to surprise you. It is none other than working at McDonald's. Okay, you probably heard about the 50,000 job openings that were filled on Tuesday. They haven't all been filled. You still have a chance. And in case you scoff or poo-poo a job at McDonald's, uh, career coach John P. Strelicki, and author of the inspirational bestseller The Why Cafe, has come up with the following reasons why working at McDonald's is a good idea. And these are really good reasons. Stick around. Listen to these. Number one. 
Jan Fields, McDonald's North American president, actually started working at McDonald's behind the counters. Yes, she started in 1978 asking if you'd like fries with that. And uh, a huge corporation like this has plenty of room for growth, and it's proved that it rewards internally over and over again. In fact, 50% of owner-operators started behind the counter, and 75% of managers started behind the counter. So they promote their own. Not a bad corporation to go to work for. Now, this next uh, reason why it's a good idea to go to work there, if you think you're overqualified, prove it. Okay, you start at 825 an hour, and it's if you're out of work, it's more than you're making right now. And if you're really good at what you do, you'll be promoted very quickly. McDonald's advances faster than the blink of an eye, practically. So there's a good uh, shot you'll be getting a promotion really quickly. Number four, being employed is better than not having a job and sitting around on your bum. It gives you a sense of purpose, it gives you motivation, uh, it gives you momentum, and it gives you importance and responsibility and the opportunity to say, yes, I am working at the moment. Okay, and the uh, last reason is look at it as a new, a new path on your road to finding your purpose. At any given time, and this is so true, especially here in LA, you never know who you'll be working next to, who you'll be serving or meeting. You could find your potential spouse, your future employer, or learn some new skills that'll make you more marketable and employable. So um, don't scoff at those 50,000 McDonald's jobs. Uh, most of the people that I've talked to that have been in management and ownership in McDonald's are very happy and very uh, appreciative of the opportunity and they get a lot of challenge and they feel like they're fairly rewarded. So it's a thought, just a thought. Okay, moving on to our guest interview. I'm really excited about our guest today. He's flown in from Hawaii to be here with us. How special do we feel? Um, this is Terry R. Bacon. He's the author of Elements of Power, Lessons on Leadership and Influence. Excuse me, I forgot the article there. The Elements of Power. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, um, and you're the scholar in residence at Corn Ferry right now, <clears throat> but right. you have a long and illustrious career in business. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I began in the academic world, uh, teaching at university, and then I joined a consulting firm uh, back in 1977 and worked with them for 11 years in corporations around the world, uh, doing a lot of education in uh, writing and communication skills. And then I left them, I uh, formed my own firm, and have been doing management consulting and education since. So it's uh, 30 plus years now. That's great. Now, I think there, there might be one or two viewers and listeners out there who might not know what Corn Ferry is. Uh, well, Corn Ferry began as an executive search firm, but it's grown into a talent uh, management company. Uh, and so today, Corn Ferry does uh, executive search. We do assessment, uh, coaching, education, a uh, variety of things related to uh, how corporations uh, develop and use their talent. Excellent. Yeah. Now, one of the things I love about your book, uh, one of the first chapters is Shakespeare ate bacon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all love bacon. That's really, and I bet you get that a lot. I do, you? I, yeah. And also, where are you from? And I have to say Canada. So. <laughs> Canadian bacon? Canadian bacon. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> tell us about Shakespeare ate bacon. It's a great way to start. Yeah, well, you know, it. Uh, the reason I chose that title is because uh, Sir Francis Bacon is the person who said knowledge is power. And I was writing a chapter about knowledge power uh, and uh, when I was a senior in, uh, in college, a group of freshmen uh, came to my room on my birthday and they uh, carried me down to the showers and threw me into the showers fully clothed. Uh, that was their uh, birthday gift to me. Nice. But they also gave me a button that said Shakespeare ate bacon. And where that comes from is that uh, there's a group of people who think that William Shakespeare didn't actually write the works of William Shakespeare. They think that Francis Bacon wrote them. Uh, and uh, so this is a comeback to say, no, no, no. William Shakespeare wrote those works himself, and he ate bacon. So I, love so I it. thought it was a great title. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And this book is all about power, uh, mostly power in the workplace. Uh, mostly power in the workplace, but it really applies to power in anywhere in any walk of life. It, it could be power in the home, power in the community, 
uh, power any place, really. So how exactly do you find, define power? Well, power is the capacity, I define it, it's the capacity to influence or lead other people. Um, so, for example, any time I want somebody else to do something, uh, I suggest to my wife that we go to a particular restaurant for dinner, for example, uh, I am trying to influence her to accept the place that I want to go. If, if I have power with her, she's more likely to say yes to me than if I don't. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> you and mean you like, don't have power with your wife on uh, well, occasion? Uh, uh, sometimes, no. <laughs> Who has more power? Oh, she does, definitely. Oh, okay, right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're listening, Mrs. Bacon. <laughs> So, um, you know, that's, that's, and I wrote this book because I was really curious about why some people are more effective at getting their way, at influencing others than, than other people are. And um, the difference is that, you know, somebody like Barack Obama, for example, who's uh, in Los Angeles today, uh, has a huge amount of power and he has the capacity to influence a lot of people. There are other people who have relatively little power and, and so they, they um, you know, they really can't get much accomplished. If you're in the workplace, or you're at school, or you're in any walk of life, the more power you have, the more capacity you have to influence and, and lead other people. So that's why it's important. Would you say that Barack Obama is probably the most powerful person in the world right now? Um, you know, probably, although, uh, you know, it would really depends on where you are. He wouldn't be the most powerful person in China, for example, that would be the premier. Of China, so it it depends on the area in which you're you're referring to. In the book, for example, I say that uh, uh, George Clooney would have a tremendous amount of power in Hollywood. Barack Obama would have less power in Hollywood. So it depends on the context in which you're you're trying to exercise power. Gotcha. I think George yeah. Clooney would have more power over me than Barack Obama. Uh, no offense. Uh, yes. You know. No. No doubt. <laughs> and Mr. Mandel, I hope you're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so. Um, how does one become a powerful person? You know, the, the book shows that there are uh, various sources of power, and you become more powerful by developing those sources. For example, when you're young, the most important power source to develop is knowledge power, uh, which I define as uh, not only what you know, but what you can do. So it's the skills you develop, the capabilities you have. And the more that you develop, the more powerful you're going to be. So you say when you're young. Is that when yeah. you're just starting out in the workplace, or are you defining even before, like, in elementary school? Oh, well, yeah, even in elementary. I mean, the reason we have children spend 12 or 16 years in school is because we're trying to help them become more powerful people in society. So it begins when you're very, very young. But uh, obviously in the workplace, when you join a company, uh, it's, you, you're, first of all, you're hired because you have some skills, because you have some knowledge. You're going to advance, though, only if you develop more knowledge on the job and more skills on the job. And, and the more capable you are of doing that, the more learning agile you are, then the more powerful you're going to become. What about someone like Bill Gates? What kind of power does he have? Well, Bill Gates is a great example because he, what, he got started by being a fabulous programmer and very knowledgeable about software and computers and programming. He parlayed Take power? that. Uh, well, exactly. <laughs> Is there such thing. Yeah, and he he parlayed that into a business that grew and grew, and uh, he eventually developed a lot of power because of his role as uh, chairman of Microsoft. He developed power because he was well networked with a lot of people after a, a period of time. He obviously developed more power because he amassed a great deal of wealth, uh, which I call resource power. So. There are a number of ways in which he became powerful and something that as he developed in his business, he also gained reputation power. And that's, reputation is how you're thought of in the community. And the more of that you have, the more highly you're thought of, the more power you have. Excellent. There, you, were talk, you just spoke about several different kinds of power. In your yeah. book, you have 11 kinds of power. 11, yeah. Or 11 sources of power. Mm -hmm. Tell me about those. Well, there are, first of all, there are personal power sources. Those are things that derive from within. So it's like the knowledge I have. Uh, I also have uh, attraction power. That's uh, my ability to cause other people to like me or be attracted to me. Uh, there's character power based on people's perception of, of my character. Um, there's uh, what I call expressiveness power, which is the ability to communicate effectively. Oh. And that turns out to be a really, really powerful source. And then there's history power, and history power is based on my close relationships. So if you and I have a close relationship, 
you will be more likely to say yes to what I want than if we don't have a relationship. So history is the length and strength of the relationships between people. So those are the personal power sources. Then there are also organizational power sources, which come about as because of my uh, belonging to an organization. So my role, that is the position I have in the organization, which gives me a certain legitimate authority. Uh, the resources I may con control, uh, information, uh, what information I have, my network, how broadly networked I am throughout the organization, and finally reputation. So those are the organizational power sources. There's one more, which is willpower, and that is my desire to be powerful coupled with acting on that desire, and that turned out to be the most powerful power source of all. Willpower. willpower. Why is yeah. that the most powerful power source? You know, because somebody who has a, a strong desire to become powerful uh, and, and acts on that, and they work at it time and they persevere despite resistance, they will become more powerful. I gave a number of examples in my book. One of them is uh, a, a relatively unknown British filmmaker named Jeremy Gilley. Uh, he was an actor, filmmaker of really no account, not much success. One day he's watching the television and he's disturbed by all the violence that's going on in the world. So he decided to create a movement called Peace One Day. And uh, that eventually led to what is now a global movement. And it, he convinced the United Nations to declare International Peace Day in every September. And the, he has developed a huge amount of power and created a worldwide organization based on his intense desire to, to do so and to be somebody. I'm giving there are ton of, tons of examples. Bill Gates is another one. Warren Buffett is another example of somebody who has persevered and, and through a lot of knowledge and sheer willpower has become one of the wealthiest people in the world. Now I imagine that willpower is also sort of a, um, that's how the not so great leaders come into power. I'm thinking that might be how Gaddafi got there, uh, and sure. that might be how Castro got there, and that might be how some of the, the, you know, Idi Amin and people like that, some of the world's biggest despots because they had such a big, such a huge desire, yeah. the, the huge willpower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, 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 the thing about power is it's, it, in a way, it's morally neutral. That is, uh, anybody like Gaddafi, like Adolf Hitler, uh, like Idi Amin, they can come to power and, and become despots because they are driven to have that power. And there's no question that, that uh, it works uh, for good and for evil. Would maybe, I could be wrong, but somebody like Gandhi, he doesn't have, I, I wouldn't have thought of him as wanting, you know, having that much willpower. He didn't have the desire for power so much, but he came to power <clears throat> through other sources. Is that well, a correct assessment? He, yes, he came to power uh, largely, I think, through, first of all, attraction, because so many people were attracted to his philosophy in India at the time, uh, through character power, because he became recognized as a person of character. Uh, and he, he eventually developed a reputation uh, in India, and then with the British government, and then across the world for uh, his intense drive toward nonviolent uh, uh, change uh, in India, which of course led to the independence of India in 1947. Um, he is an example of somebody who's kind of a moral uh, a guardian or exemplar, uh, uh, and that galvanized a lot of people behind him, and that's how he developed a fo followership. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm thinking of different people with different leadership styles have to mm -hmm. exercise different kinds of power. I think yeah. of if I'm doing an assessment of my own power, as limited as it may be, I'm I don't really have a desire to have power, but I do have a desire to influence people mm -hmm. in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So. Would that be willpower, or that would be something uh, else? You know, I think that would be willpower, and, it, and you're bringing up a good point, which is it depends on where you set your sights. Now, if you wanted to become head of Universal Studios or something like that, you would have the desire to, uh, to work in a different way and, and build power in a different way in order to reach that goal. Uh, so I think each of us has a uh, desire. Now, I don't have a desire to become Bill Gates or to become the next president of the United States, so I'm not going to work for that. Uh, so it, it does depend on where you set your sights. Interesting. Okay. Um, 
What do you do when someone is, when you feel like someone is wielding um, inappropriate power over you? How do you deal with an egomaniac or a power hungry fool? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, there, really there are limited options, honestly. You, you, you can confront the person, you can, you, can, you can decide to live with it, which is, of course, what many people in abusive marital relationships do, at least for a period of time and maybe forever. Uh, I don't think that's a good solution, but some people just say, I'm going to accept it. Uh, you can also uh, confront the person, you know, so you can, you can es in essence, engage in conflict with them about what they're doing. Which is scary. Uh, which is scary. Often. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Me. Yeah. Because they may have a considerable amount of uh, coercive power against you. Um, and some people just choose to uh, vote with their feet, which means they just walk away from it. You know, there are some relationships that are not worth being into, and whether it's in business or in marriage. And uh, sometimes the best solution is to say, I'm going to take away your power by leaving. That makes a lot of sense. It does, yeah. Yeah. Now, your book has so many interesting examples of people, of people who have risen to power, people who have fallen from power, and reasons. Mm -hmm. How did you pick the people that you uh, included in the book? Well, I wanted to show that with, with just about every power source, it's possible for that to be a source of power for you. It can also be what I call a power drain. That is, it can take power away from you. And I wanted to choose people that, uh, by and large, readers would know uh, so I chose Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, for example. I chose Eleanor Roosevelt as an example of character power. Um, and I, I chose some other people as, a, as negative examples uh, because, again, people would be familiar with them. On character power, for example, I, on the, the negative side, I chose Elliot Spitzer. You know, Interesting. Yeah, and how does he get his? He ha, he still has tremendous power. He's got his own news show. You know, he's he's you know he's he's making a valiant effort to make a comeback, but if you look at where he was just after he resigned as governor of New York, he really was at a very low power point that time, and he had gone from a real high. The other people talking about him um, running for president and having oh, no, oh, yeah, absolutely say it isn't yeah. so. Oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh. Um, so he went from the heights to real depths uh, after he had to admit that affair that he was having with the prostitute and resigned from the governorship, you know, just days after that became public. Um, he is making a strong attempt to come back, uh, and I, you know, I gave him a lot of kudos for that. Will he ever again be running for and elected to a national office or a governorship or uh, the president? No. Uh, he won't be forgiven for, for what he did uh, because of that blemish on his character. But he is making an attempt. And it does show, by the way, that you can lose power uh, and still not necessarily be down forever. You know, it is possible to make a comeback. One of the interesting people that you used as an example is Rahm Emanuel. Yeah. And he so he's went from one power <laughs> position to another. To another, yeah. Let's talk about him for a few minutes. Yeah, Rahm Emanuel was a, a, a person that I ex used as an example of network power. He is extremely well networked, uh, which means he knows a huge number of people, and he knows a lot of powerful people. And his family's well networked his too. His family's well networked. He was well known in the Chicago Democratic, you know, uh, political machine, and uh, he because of that. Uh, that network and his, his abilities, he, he was chosen as, of course, the chief of staff of the White House, even though up until the very end he had supported Hillary Clinton for the uh, nomination and not Barack Obama, his fellow Chicagoan. Uh, but Obama recognized that uh, what he brought to the chief of staff position was a tremendous knowledge of other people and an ability to connect with people. And I think when he decided to resign and run for mayor of uh, Chicago, he had that network with him there, and that's one of the key reasons that he was successful there. That's, he's such an interesting guy. He's such a fun he person is. to watch. Yeah. Now, a, another one that I um, picked out that you talked about was, uh, and I never pronounce her name right, Indra Nui. Did uh -huh. I say that Indra right? Indra Nui. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, she's the uh, CEO of PepsiCo. And uh, Indra Nui is a fascinating character. Uh, she's been described many times as one of the most powerful female executives in the world. And I used her as an example of role power. So role power is the power of the position that you have in an organization. She has huge power in Pepsi, and she exercises it well. 
and she also is on a, a number of boards, and she is a person who, if she wants to be listened to about a particular issue in the business world in particular, people will listen be, because of where she is. Now, the, the interesting part about her is that she, uh, she also plays, uh, did in, in school, she played in a rock band, and she occasionally still does. I uh, didn't know play that. At, what does she play? Do you know? Well, in, at Pepsi uh, events. No, I mean, did she yeah. play like bass or lead? I, or you know, drums I'm not really or... sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But That's kind of anyway, cool. It is cool. Good yeah. for her. Good for her. Yeah, it's one of the, I, I love her example of, as a female with power yes. who just wears it exceptionally well. Yeah, she does. Um, and then speaking of individuals with interesting kinds of power, you, some people that you wouldn't necessarily put on the level of, of, of Inder Nui or, or a world leader, but still have a remarkable amount of power, which you pound, po point out in the book, mm -hmm. are Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Let's talk about yeah. their power. Yeah, well, you know, they are uh, wonderful examples of uh, attraction power. So one of the things I write in about in the book is to say that uh, one of the power sources is the ability to attract other people or draw them to you, to cause them to like you or want to be with you. And attraction power is based partly on, on physical beauty and it's based partly, uh, based, uh, partly on personality or charm or friendliness, uh, uh, having common interests or values. All of those things can make you more attractive to someone. I chose them though because they are, uh, they're really great examples of beautiful people who have a lot of power because they're so attractive, but they also do a tremendous number of charitable uh, works. So they give a lot of money, they have an, a very eclectic family that they've, they've grown uh, sometimes through adoption. They are uh, committed to a number of causes around the world and they, they give a lot to that and that enhances their attractiveness to a lot of people. We talked a little bit about physical attractiveness before we, yeah. uh, a little bit before the show, and you told me some fascinating things because, I mean, it, it's your your attractive attraction power does have something to do with the way you look, correct? It absolutely does, yeah, and that's uh, that's uncomfortable for a lot of people to, to accept that, but there is ample research that shows that that uh, good-looking people uh, have kind of a halo effect, and that is they are considered to be more honest, more trustworthy, uh, to ha be more self-confident, uh, and in every way. For example, uh, studies of uh, school children show that when teachers were asked to rate uh, various school children uh, about whether they would go to college and whether they would be successful in life, uh, teachers chose the good-looking kids over the ordinary looking kids. How curious. They it probably is, it, weren't even aware that they were doing no, it. No, they had no, they wasn't set up so they would recognize that they were doing that. In fact, this is just amazing. Some research shows that babies respond better to good looking people than they do to ordinary looking people. Baby. That's so wild. It is. It's astonishing. And is it a cultural thing? Of, no, it's not a it's cultural not? thing. No, it's just a human thing. Oh my gosh. Uh, it is amazing. So nice looking people have advantages in life that uh, ordinary people don't. Now, wh you know, what, to what extent is that an advantage? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Good looking people earn about 12% more in income than ordinary looking people. So it's about a 12% advantage at least. My goodness. Yeah. That's so interesting. Okay. It is. Aside from looks, aside from plastic surgery, what are some of the things that we can do to develop our power and enhance it? Well, I, the, the interesting part about what I, what I learned is that uh, communication skills are absolutely important. In fact, people who communicate well, who have high expressiveness power, uh, are more than three times more influential than people who are just average communicators. So one of the things you can do is join Toastmasters, ah. take a presentation skills class, you know, do whatever you can to improve your ability to art be articulate and eloquent in speaking to other people and writing to other people. So that's one thing. Another is to really build your skills and protect your reputation. Reputation powers also uh, can make you three times more powerful than people who just have an average reputation. So you want to protect your reputation at all costs. And, Reputation in business, by the way, is it's based partly on character and pa partly on your attraction power. It's also based, though, and mainly based on the results you get uh, and doing a good job. So I tell young people, you know, take every job seriously, 
do the best you can at everything you do because you, you want to develop a reputation as a person of quality who gets the job done on time excellently. That will enhance your power faster than anything else. So even if you're taking one of those 50,000 jobs at McDonald's, do it well. Do it well, absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. This time has just flown. I could. I wish this show were three hours long. We could go on and on and on. There's so many important things to learn because, as we all know, I mean, power makes or breaks a career. It absolutely does. That's right. <laughs> it's so important. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This is. I hope you've gotten as much out of this half hour as I have. Um, we'll be here again next week. This will be online in perpetuity in about 24 hours, so uh, you can watch it anytime. Um, thank you for coming again. You've been watching This Week in Careers, where we're trying to save America one job at a time. See you next week. <laughs>